Hello and welcome to Just Bleed Radio. This is episode 23 and I'm glad I double checked that because otherwise I'd have been dead wrong to death because I actually thought this was episode 22 and near miss there. Anyway, we're back with a full length show for UFC 301 that took place over the weekend in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Don't forget to drop us a like, leave us a comment and if you're not subscribed yet, please do. Our very modest goal is to reach 50 subscribers and we're not too far away from that. So please do subscribe. Anyways, enough with that. I'm your host, DM, and as usual, I'm joined by my two friends from across the pond. He's the only book I I know. He's all the way from Ohio. It's Lazy Bed. Sup, Lazy? How you doing, man? Doing pretty good. Doing good. Uh, interesting night there. <laughs> and, uh, despite not having uh, too much recollection of the evening, I think I might be able to come up with some hot takes today. And also with us, all the way from the Golden State, Eureka, it's Austin. And I say Eureka, but it's more God damn it because he beat me on the picks last week, going 10-2 and two versus my 9-3. and three. So he was last week's champion. How are you doing, Austin? Uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, no, I've uh, been doing fairly well. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure my picks went to shit this weekend. But <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I know I'm in the survival pool because I picked... Pantosia, so I know I'm still in the survivor pool, whatever that means. So, uh, yeah, not bad. Not, not, a, no, not a too bad weekend. <laughs> I had noticed that you and uh, Dave were still in the survivor's pool. I don't know whether Dave still is. Anyway, uh, we're going to do things a little different today, and we're going to start by talking about Jones versus Poetan, and then we'll go from <laughs> top to bottom on the card. So it is John dodging Tom. It would be a massive fight, there's no argument, but surely if John wants to fight after he beats Stipe, presumably he does, which we all think he will, uh, it has to be against an in- it has to be against the interim belt holder, surely. It can't be against anyone else. It would be a complete piss take to let John take that fight ahead of Tom. God <laughs> I know Austin's gonna go off on this one. I well, I I I know I'm gonna step over lazy. I'm sorry. Is that okay? I just I just got a quick. All right. So here's my thing. All right. So I have no issue with John wanting to fight another champion, especially one as big as uh, um, you know, Pereira, Potan. But like, goddamn, dude. Like you've only fought once in the fucking division. If we're gonna have you just go out here and pretend to be the champion and not fight the interim champion, yes. Tom doesn't maybe have the greatest name out there, and he's probably just another contender without the belt. But God forbid, let's just put some closure on this goddamn division. You haven't fought more than once in five years. God forbid you're trying to fight another guy in Stipe who hasn't fought in four almost. Oh, wait, that's right. Let's get the smaller, less grappling aesthetic uh, champion at light heavyweight, not even in your own weight class. Let's go ahead and try to make that fight because that makes sense. No, no, it doesn't. It actually doesn't. It's fucking stupid because God forbid we actually move this division along. No, there's no reason for this fight to happen, at least not right now, because you actually have a number one contender in Tom Aspen. All right. <laughs> Fire. I'm sorry. It's, just, it's, like, it's, it's like, what are we doing here? What are we doing here? Come on. <laughs> I obviously completely agree. How about you, Lizzie? What do you want to say on this one? Well, fucking John. What I mean, what can you say about this guy? Like, I th- everything that can be said has already been said. And Jed Mishu sums it up best every single fucking time. Chickens can't be goats. So you can't be running around doing this fucking chicken shit bullshit and expecting <laughs> that you're going to uh, end your career as the goat. Uh, they want to do the Stipe fight. The Stipe fight is going to happen. I'm almost 100%. I don't know why, but that's like that seems to be the brass at UFC, like their little pet project. They want that fucking thing to happen. Uh, I'm, I'm, I don't know. I don't know, man. Like, if you're John Jones, you want a money fight you want all money fights until your career is up because you don't have much time left and you know it. And you know that you got a guy in Tom who is probably the only guy primed to fucking beat you. So of course you're going to skirt around it and you're going to try to find every excuse not to take it. But everyone can see the writing on the wall. Like it's the fight that has to happen. So if you're him, I don't know how you avoid it. 
No, well, he shouldn't be able to. I understand John John is playing it very, very well here. He's been on Twitter getting these tweets out. He's been hiding all the ones that disagree with him, of course. Uh, <laughs> that but, was going to uh, be my biggest thing. It's like <laughs> you individually hiding tweets that are yeah. telling you you are ducking the interim champion, saying that this fight makes more sense for you than going after the smaller, less accomplished, technically not less accomplished, but it's like one has been fighting as a heavyweight, the entirety of his career. The other one has just barely made it to light heavyweight and is doing fairly well. Like, the what are we doing here? Like, yeah, there's the other thing as well. That of course John's saying that Tom has no right to have really to be have a go at the, being the champion when John came into an open division fighting a decider for the belt. Yeah, so he, has, he has no more right to be a, the champion than Tom Aspinall does. In fact, Tom Aspinall arguably has more he has more fights at heavyweight than john has uh, well it's but like I, it it's not even like it's not even a thing where it's like he is the undisputed champion he it's by definition disputed when you have an interim and <laughs> the current heavyweight <laughs> champion like by that definition it means that there are two champions in the same weight class which does not happen in mma because there's usually one champion the interim usually establishes himself as a number one contender because they can't fight the actual champion this is in boxing where we can break up four different belts inside of one division because there's multiple promotions and or i should say multiple commissions that's <laughs> that's not what should be happening here do you think that all that ultimately that the UFC will make enough money from a Jones and Stipe fight to justify all this fucking tomfoolery? No. No, probably not. So, like, what the fuck are they gaining by pussyfooting around like this? And, like... I'm not sure. I think it was the mixed Molly Whopper video. Uh, he was talking about it. And he, I th if I'm remembering correctly, because it was late at night and I probably had had a few drinks. Uh, it was, was suggesting that Dana might have the hatchet, you know, looking to set John up and set him up so he has to fight Tom Aspinall because, because of the past, uh, those texts that were released during the um, last legal uh, uh, spat. Yeah. There were a lot of that came out with John uh, Dana saying how much they disliked John. They wanted him, you know, he was a pain in the neck and all the rest of it. So... Does yeah, he, that's that's when he took that. Well, I was gonna say that's when he took that three-year hiatus off to yeah. become a heavyweight, right? Yeah, I believe so. Yeah. So <sighs> then, then why not? That. Go, I was just gonna say that. Then why don't they push him into this fight rather than allow him to fucking sit around and wait for Stipe? Like, I think I, I think they're happy enough to give John that one fight, and then if he tops off and sails off into the future then they've got rid of him. But if he wants to stick around, I don't think... They're not going to give him Alex. It has to be Tom. Yeah. No argument. I Because I, th I think what it is is that if they can't secure a date with Stipe, they're looking for another money fight. And I think what they're trying... I think what John wants to do is go out on a money fight. John, John's already said it. It's about dollars. Yeah. He, it's about legacy and all the rest of it. Well, the, the quote, one of the quotes he made, he said he needs motivation to want to fight, which is very understandable. Obviously, he's been in the game a long time, but that motivation should be to be the greatest at what he's doing. It shouldn't. He's, he's wanting to fight Alex because Alex has legacy, which again makes sense. It's good marketing. John's being clever there, but he still doesn't have any fucking right to be fighting Alex Pereira. Just show no. up, John. I'm glad people have roasted him on Twitter. Well, it would make more sense if he went back down to light heavyweight, but if I'm understanding it correctly, he's trying to get Poton to come up to heavyweight, right? Exactly, yeah. So it's the classic, <laughs> classic one. You, you're bullying a guy who's smaller than you. Congratulations, John. You've really, really uh, reached new levels of scumbaggery. <laughs> I, I almost feel like him tweeting that out was utter bullshit, though, because what the fuck does he care what the fans think? So, and that was the whole point of his tweet. Like, I don't know. What do you guys think? Is this the biggest fight? Like, you don't yeah, give a shit. No, he's just trying to get money, and he's trying to get fans that will agree with him, which there are plenty that have done, but they're just idiots. That, yeah. Well, the only thing I could say to what John's, and I guess 
the UFC's incentive it would be is that the fan base of casuals, and I, I have to stress that casuals seem to want him to fight Poton more than they would Tom Aspinall, which is asinine to me because one is in the same division, and the other. He's like he's barely established control of his division, and he's still on top of it. Has three contenders that he could fight, technically four, if you want to count a Jamal Hill that wins his next fight. Um, I, I it he has the that's the thing. It's weird to me is that the UFC is so willing to just throw their divisions up into chaos without any further like second thought about it. Like, well, this is they don't. John attempting to throw the divisions up. It hasn't been accepted. I don't think Dana's made any comments on it. They've done it willingly before, and it's not out of the question that they won't do it again, but it's just interesting to see. It's like, instead of establishing control in these divisions that help create champions that turn into stars, like, that's what GSP was. That's what Anderson Silva was. Like, we want to keep comparing ourselves to these guys who had established actual stardom in an era that was incredibly hard to do so that weren't already stars like Chuck Liddell, Tito Ortiz before, before that Chael Sonnen became a star without a belt. And that was because he could trash talk and articulate himself. He wasn't always the best at it, but at the same time, it's like John Jones is the last of that era. An established championship resume of constant defenses, even though he's not the greatest shit talker, even though he's not the greatest um, when it comes to the actual fights uh, visually. We just know that he usually wins, regardless of how the outcome should have been. Yeah, he's, as you say, he's been around the longest as, as far as champions go. Yeah. Despite his breaks, obviously. This does yeah. have fuel to the fire that he dodged Francis. Can't. Oh, really I mean. <laughs> uh, it's almost without question that he may have dodged Francis at this point. <laughs> uh, anyway, what I will say is... Uh, Mojahead, uh, Mojahead Fedele, I'm not 100% sure how you say his surname, uh, has the best video of this uh, situation. Oh, it no. might, be, might be the best video I've ever seen. I was laughing my head off all the way through. I immediately went back and rewatched it. It was really, really funny. Uh, I won't <laughs> for anyone, but please go and watch it. Give that guy some love. Yeah. <laughs> it's entertaining, that's for sure. <laughs> So let's let's get on to uh, UFC 301, and uh, some people may be pleased to hear that I probably won't have very much to say today, because in the middle of the Aldo Martinez p- uh, fight, my PC crashed and wiped out all my notes for the card, uh, <laughs> very, uh, which I foolishly hadn't saved. So I thought Lazy and Austin could take the strain on this show, but it turns out Lazy had quite the night, and to quote him from the his, from the Discord, he took no notes and he got tanked. So, <laughs> So it looks like myself and Lazer in a similar situation, although he arrived here in a far more pleasant manner. Uh, so we, but we do have our MVP, Austin. He, he uh, here in his in fine condition, he's warmed up very nicely on John Jones. So let's get on to the main event between Alexandra Pat- Pat- Pantoja. God, I can't speak tonight. Alexandra Pantoja and Steve Ersag. Um And I'm not going to do a run through because there are people who are far, far better at that than I am. Plus, I don't have any notes. Uh, slightly controversial fight. I thought Ursaig probably did enough, but I was very worried on that fifth round when he got, you know, the the action hit the ground. And although Pantoja didn't do anything to him, it was apparently enough in the eyes of the judges. I'm not sure which judge gave it 49-46 to Pantoja. He needs his eyes eyes examining. There was some very there was some very dodgy uh, judging points on. The entire card, I think, but we'll probably get to each one individually. Uh, so yeah, I I would I would have been happy if Ersig won it. I don't. He did cause the only two notable pieces of damage: an elbow in round three that cut Pantoja uh, and really had Pantoja worried. He was pouring at it for the rest of the round, and then he cut him again in round five. So that's if you just go on damage, that's two rounds surely, and then he. Round four, there was no argument as far as I remember. He clearly controlled it. Pantoja was taking a bit of a break. It was backed up for most of it. So, yeah, I think Ersig probably would have won it. But funnily enough, Robert Whittaker, his fellow Aussie, disagreed. He gave the fight to Pantoja. So, uh, yeah, that's. <laughs> I'll just let... Uh... Do you want to jump on it, Lazy? You got anything to say on this one? Yeah, yeah, I got some stuff to say about this one. Uh... Okay. I was I was actually prior to uh, 
recording this episode. And prior to these fights, I was thinking back to uh, one of our previous episodes where we were talking about this fight and we were discussing it coming up. And uh, I was saying how I was really hoping that Steve Ursegg was going to be the guy for Australia to get it done and bring a title back. Unfortunately, our boy, little Vinny Siggs, couldn't get it done. Uh, you know, I think that the, the, a, a lot of people thought and felt the same thing as me when while watching this fight. Uh, bad choices, man. Just some some boneheaded decision making by Ursig. Uh, going for the takedowns late in the fight, or specifically that last takedown in the fifth round. Uh, but also, you know, several others that might have been a bit questionable. But going into these these grappling exchanges when you know, the, the fight is hanging in the balance and you, you're finding openings and windows on the feet. Like you're, as the fight went on, it seemed like he was really coming into his own and finding his groove and the strikes that were working. Like you pointed out, DM the elbows and uh, just, it, it felt like, I don't know if you want to blame his corner. I seen some people online blaming his corner, telling him in uh, going into that fifth round that he needed a finish that maybe he was fishing for a submission in that fifth there, and that's why he went for the takedown. But uh, just I, personally on my scorecards, I would have probably given it to Ursega. I would have given it just edging it out just minorly on damage. But I don't think you can complain too much uh, having it go Pantoja's way. Uh, I was really disappointed in this one. I thought Ursega was going to pull it out. I mean, I had high hopes. I think he's got a bright future in the division, obviously. You just went in there and you hung with the champion for five rounds. Uh, answered a lot of questions that people had about his his grappling and his BJJ. and Just great performance, uh, you know, ultimately by both guys. But my big takeaway from this one was just disappointment for Ursig. So, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Okay, so quick question, Lazy. Which uh, your scorecard? You you said you would have edged it to uh, Ursig. Uh, what round would you say was a toss or uh, the swing round? Um, thinking back, probably. I mean, I guess you would say the fifth, right? Yeah, mine. Mine was the third. Mine was the third because I felt. Like, that was the one that was the closest. Yeah, you might and be right. That, that was kind of the round that Pantoja sort of took off, right? It, yeah, like, his, 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 like, workload, like, he, he tried to kind of... He couldn't really get a whole lot of control, and his damage mm -hmm. wasn't nearly as, as high as you would expect it to be. He was eating a little bit more shots on the top, and, you know, that second round, he... Um, well, I think... He, I just jumping in, I think the majority of people had it at two rounds all going into the fifth. Hmm. I think, yeah, because I, I had it 10-9 in the first for uh, Alex Pants. And uh, since we're calling Vinny Siggs uh, for Steve Versing, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I, I had it... Um, just just a little bit more control in the grappling. The stand-up seemed to be a little competitive on the feet. Like, uh, Ursig was the cleaner boxer, but Pantoja, Pantoja was still landing, and as well as throwing some knees in there. Um, and the second round, just better significant combinations and just accuracy with that jab and then just throwing the hook when he needed to. And occasionally, uh, there would been, I think he landed an uppercut or two. And then that third is the toss-up for me because it's just he did... Vinny Six did enough just to just to get the damage quota that you would need to win the round, especially in this kind of fight. Well, he, but he cut him. He, the the biggest he, cut of the fight. It didn't seem to phase Pantoja nearly as bad as you would expect. Like, yeah, he I, felt it. He was, was boring at it for the most of the round until he went back to his corner. His corner yeah. told him not to worry. They did some yeah. nice work on it. I mean, but he he, he, he seemed to. He definitely shook him. It definitely, he definitely it, knocked him off his stride. He stopped striking after that. He started to want to get the action back clinch, to the cage yeah. and, and clinch. So that was surely I, clearly that's I the just, clearest. I think it clearest just came at the end of the, of the round, though. That's what I'm thinking is that it came at the end of the round where it he couldn't capitalize on the damage. The damage was landed, but it 
it wasn't enough to like derail just the round. I, I think for Pantheon, it's yeah. damage. It is physical damage that you can see. It's it's a it's it's damage that landed, but it's more um, what's the word? Um, it's a dominant cruise effect, where he thinks a cut means the uh, other person wins the round. I don't, I don't think need, that's the I case. We don't need that here because there was a cut in round three and there was a cut in round five. Yeah, I think I think the thing is is that this brings up my other point is that I'll finish up with this. Uh, I had it all together, forty eight, forty seven, giving round four to uh, Vinny Sigs, and then also giving round five to Pen- Alex Pants. So. My my thinking on it is that it was competitive throughout. The toss up round for me was round three, but my my point being this is that I think this commission, the Brazilian commission, and I think you had said it earlier, lazy. It was um, it was Cab, uh, right? That yeah. does this. So it's not the Nevada Athletic. It's not the New York or California. It's its own commission. And when you go to another commission, yes, you have your set of rules, but they also have a rule set that they will follow. And, or at least adhere to. I'm imagining they reward grappling more than they yeah. would if it was in the United States. So that's that's kind of where I'm coming from on this. Well, so, so basically, I, we could say if this if this was unified rules, Ursek should have won. Ursek could have. I would say could have won. Doesn't okay. mean he would, but it, it, under the criteria, you would have favored him yeah. if this had taken place in Nevada. But it didn't. It, so it, it did not. Um, it, yeah, and it, it's the, here's the thing. We can argue about who won the fight, but this was not a terrible for port performance. Even yes, he even though he kind of gave the fifth round away a little bit, like Lazy was saying, and, and I agree, he kind of he kind of like was winning certain aspects of the fight and chose to kind of willingly jump into somebody's better game. Yeah, a lack of fight IQ there. He should have should have stayed standing. In the earlier rounds, I understood the takedown attempts, because, and I was I I was catching on to it before even the commentary was, because I was listening to them and they kept questioning why he was going for the takedown attempts. I think it was just to mix it up to give uh, yeah. Pantosha something to think about, and then right, and then also knowing that Pantosha would likely gas out uh, if if he was forced to engage in multiple grappling scenarios or the uh, transitions between striking and grappling. Uh, mm-hmm. So I, I think that in the, maybe the first three rounds for sure, maybe the first four, it was a reasonable tactic, but in that fifth round, like I just, I, I it was a silly move because you, you had to have known like in your heart, like this, this feels pretty even to me, uh, you know, oh, so I need to do, just I need to do that. Don't don't forget his corner told him he'd lost the first three rounds. Right, yeah. So that's what I'm saying. Like he he had the inkling going into that fifth that he needed to get a finish. So I don't know if maybe he thought he was gonna pull out a submission if he did get a takedown and maybe get a, a finish that he needed to win the fight. But if he had a better idea that maybe it was two two going into that, like I don't know if he would have gone for that takedown and yeah. I don't know. Maybe his corner would have said something different to him. Yeah. But it's just watching watching Steve Ursig, aka Vinny Sigs, just go out there and be competitive with Pandosia in his fourth fight inside of the UFC against a man who had basically ran through most of the division, albeit only one man who he had struggled with was Davis and Figueredo. Like that's impressive. You yeah. you cannot take away what he did and how. Yes, he, you can argue that maybe he had some lapse in judgment or some you know inconsistencies in his game or just you know he was he's a new guy. He's still young, you know. I don't he's, think that he's a future champion. I don't think yeah, there's very much yeah. about that at all. Yep, that's what I was gonna say because I I didn't get the feeling that those lapses in judgment came from the moment being too big for him. Like he yes. felt he looked and appeared and fought like he was comfortable in the moment. Like he could handle the championship spotlight. He went five rounds with, with, like you guys are saying, a guy that has pretty much run roughshod on the division. Uh, you know, it didn't didn't look bad in that fifth round. Still looked pretty fresh. So he has Perfect. the championship cardio. I mean, what else can you say about a guy so fucking early in his 
UFC career, but also his career in general. Like, this isn't a seasoned vet. And yeah. he went out there and fought like one. He certainly did. Yeah. Uh, one last thing for me. Uh, sorry to steal your uh, same phrase. <laughs> like, hey. see, uh, <laughs> I'm, giving you, I'm giving you two minutes, Austin, and then I'm cutting you off. I know, uh, so, uh, funny thing, I thought about this when I was watching the fight. Doesn't he look an awful lot like Rory McDonald? Like the way he fights, not not in physicality or look, but the legitimately his the way and style of fight. Like he's great on his feet, he's great on the ground, and he's just he's composed. Like he he doesn't show that he's not you know new to this, even though his record might say otherwise. It's just I I, I found that eerily similar. Um, the way yeah. he fought and the way Roy McDonald used to. I would say yeah, their their composure is definitely similar similar. They have that sort of, they got that kind of serial killer vibe, like (laughs) just a fucking calm on the, on that, on the surface, but underneath, you know, that there's fucking like a tidal wave of rage in there somewhere. All right. Let's go on to the co-main event then. Uh, Unless you guys want to discuss what, what's next for her sake. I guess we've talked enough on him, but could, what do you think would be next for him? I, I think that they they find a way one way or another, another to get him on that Perth card coming up. Uh, being that that's his hometown, it's a quick turnaround. It's only like three months, but yeah, they they're gonna yeah they'll find somebody to match him up with. Yeah, uh, agreed with Lazy. Um, the opponent should be Royval. Honestly, I think he fucks up Royval. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Big yep. Keep him busy. <laughs> Keep him in contendership. <laughs> Yeah, it's a big jump, but he's already fought the uh, the champion. Yeah, so. I was going to say, <laughs> he can't go <laughs> backwards now. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's go on to the Coleman then. Uh, Jose Aldo defeats Jonathan Martinez by unanimous, unanimous decision, 30-27 on all three judges' cards. The king is back. Uh, this, I, I actually picked Jose, and then I changed my mind at kind of the last minute and picked Martinez instead. So uh, I'm not good to though when a cha- you know an old champion comes back and wins again, absolutely fantastic. He looked mean, he looked crisp. It took him, and I, I know he won the first round, but it, it, he wasn't as fired up as he came on much stronger in the second, and then in the third he had everything under control. Spotted the opportunity to get a nice little takedown at the end and just seal the deal. Proper champions uh, move. Looked great. Okay, his boxing was fantastic. Far better than Martinez. They did have a bit of exchange of leg kicks at the start, but that eventually died off. I don't think uh, Martinez had that much success. Uh, maybe Aldo had more. I can't remember. Uh, but allegedly, Aldo's last fight on his UFC contract. So is it? Will we see him back in the UFC, or is he just going to go to boxing, which was what he was doing before he came back? Uh, lazy. This one was, uh, you know, it shocked me, but it probably shouldn't have shocked me. I had a whole different idea of how this fight was going to go in my mind. Uh, maybe, maybe part of that was me overrating Martinez. Uh, maybe part of that was me uh, underrating Aldo at this point in his career. I really thought that with two years off and... I believe two boxing matches. Uh, so basically two years of focusing on nothing but boxing, being out of the MMA space, the, the time leading up to his retirement, the fact that he had gotten away from his patented signature leg kicks, I really thought that this fight was going to go down like Martinez was going to come in there and just fucking chew up his legs the way he had everyone up to this point and whether Aldo tried to check them or not, he was just going to beast up and fucking kick through the checks. Um, but <laughs> the fucking exact opposite happened. Uh, Mar- like you said, DM yeah, Martinez, he did throw a couple of leg kicks early in that first round Aldo checked them. And then it was just kind of like they fucking disappeared for the majority of the rest of the fight. Uh, sporadically few and far between he threw a couple, but outside of that, he really had no offense. Uh, Aldo looked fucking sharp, man. He looked fast as a whip. His striking was clean as crisp as ever. Uh, I actually think that he looked better last night 
after two years away from MMA than he did in either of his boxing matches. He looked way, way, way better last night. Uh, and I think that it's the inclusion of kicks really, really helps Aldo and his style. And it's, I'm not sure how exactly because I'm no striking expert, but I think it really helps his defense as well because he looked sharp on both ends of the spectrum last night, defensively and offensively. Uh, just fucking shoot Martinez up. And I was high on Martinez coming into this. I really thought that he had, you know, with a win, with, with a win over Otto, I thought that he had a, 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 basically a clear main line to a potential title shot with a, another win or so, uh, two. But, uh, yeah, just fucking uh, my biggest takeaway from this was never underestimate the heart of a champion never underestimate the fucking will and uh, skill of a guy like Jose Aldo who has been to the mountaintop and back again. Uh, and going forward, I, I hope he does not sign with the UFC again. Some people are speculating, you know, he, he could be, yeah, yeah there is, some people are saying a potential title shot against O'Malley. Like, I'm like, that's just fucking crazy. Talk to me. And also you just got the fucking hooks of the UFC out of you. Finally, like, yeah, go out there and chase that bag. Uh, yeah. I, I have a, uh, an oddball off the wall. Uh, plan that I would like to see executed, but I'm, I won't bring that up. I'll save that for another time. It's like you can't tease us like that. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I felt like I was going a little long there. I didn't want to keep going. Uh, no, you it, good. Uh, yeah. If, if it's me and I'm if I'm living in a bit of a fantasy world here, you got a free agent Jose Auto for the first time in fucking eons. Conor McGregor, he's out there. He just purchased a stake in BKFC. What has he got? Uh, two fights left on his contract as well? Maybe one fight? Well, he's got the Chandler fight booked and allegedly another one after that. <laughs> that so is a crazy idea you're taking there, Lazy. Yeah. I love it, but it's crazy. Should, should Conor McGregor get this Chandler fight, which was announced last night? They did the teaser trailer, so it looks like it's official. That's good. Yeah, it happened during the broadcast. A little bit of a teaser commercial. So should the 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 Chandler fight go down, somehow McGregor pulls out a win, and if he has to, he gets one more. Maybe uh, just some fucking washed up bum legend in the UFC. Why not Conor McGregor versus Jose Auto two in BKFC in 2025, Knuckle Mania five. You got you got Connor and fucking Jose Auto too as the headliner. Maybe stick uh, uh, Mike Perry and Jorge Masvidal in the co-main. Biggest card of all time for BKFC. Yeah, holy shit, that would be one hell of a card. <laughs> it's a wild That's theory. Bad, I, didn't say it's, I didn't say it's realistic. No, but it, it, could <laughs> it could happen. I could honestly see that being more realistic than John Jones fighting Tom Aswinall willingly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and the, oh, other, the other caveat to that is it, it'll happen at uh, like a 165 pound weight. So we're going to get to see 165 pound Jose Aldo. All oh, juice. man, that'd be Jesus. <laughs> Completely <laughs> fucking on every type of juice he can get. All, all that good horse meat, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, shit. Oh, my God. I'm so glad you went first because that was great. <laughs> uh, all right. Um, looking at this fight, I um, I had two things in mind. And, yes, I did pick Martinez. I won't sugarcoat it. I had just oh, – I did not see – I did not see on Aldo path to victory with the Aldo that I had seen uh, both in the small smidgens of – outside of the OC boxing that he did in the um, the last couple of fights that he had had. To me, it looked like Aldo was kind of walking in to set up Jonathan Martinez and let whatever star power he had kind of wash over to uh, Pantoja um, via the uh, Brazilian winning uh, in, you know, their hometowns. Um, the... The willingness of which Jose was willing to throw those late kicks, even after checking Martinez's number one and 
majority of his weapons, um, his leg kicks. Like, he was just out there just, all right, I'm going to check a kick. I'm going to throw a kick. I'm even going to throw a head kick. Like, holy shit. Like, this was the most active Aldo had been with his mid, like his lower half of his body in striking that I had seen in the last four years. Yeah. And that's including with the two years off. <laughs> like, yeah. like, like you were saying, Lazy, I think this was just something where he just needed to restart. So I'll take us on a little path here. I'm not going to be too long, but it's going to make sense. Jose Aldo's fall from grace as featherweight all time. Great. After he loses to Conor McGregor, he, you know, comes back, bounces back from a, a, a competitive uh, fight where he won the interim belt. And then, uh, against Frankie Edgar, and then, you know, defended it against Max Holloway, in which, again, he did lose. Like, he had to kind of re- readjust his, uh, you know, his game plan and readjust how he did everything, and then he loses to Max again, and then he just kind of flounders at Featherweight. He then loses to Volkanovski. After going on a run, you know, he finished Jeremy Stevens, and he was competitive against, uh, or he knocked out uh, Hanata Marcano as well. He... He has a, a boring decision loss in Rio to Alexander Volkanovsky, who basically took the fight away from him, much like Martinez tried to do tonight. He, he lunges up against the cage. Aldo's never been great in the clinch against the cage. And that's kind of the thinking that led me to think that, okay, well, if plan A doesn't work with the leg kicking, at least Martinez can adjust. He's good at adjusting at a bare minimum. Uh, plan B was to clinch in the cage against the cage and um it did seem to kind of halt some of his offense you know keep him limited to what he could do but aldo again wasn't afraid to kind of keep fighting and that was the thing we noticed in his second you know string of fights at bantamweight uh his first run at bantamweight i should say where he literally was going off of this, you know, new rejuvenated Josie Alder. Oh my God, he suffered at uh, making featherweight. How is he going to make bantamweight? And turns out, uh, it doesn't matter if you just happen to be the harder hitter and the guy who has like a slightly better chin. You know, God forbid these guys are, you know, all cutting weight massively to make 135 because they're not small guys. They're, you know, they're literally beating the shit out of each other even worse so at 35 than some of the 45 pounder fights. But. Jose Aldo then, you know, loses the title fight and then uh, against um, Peter Jan and then has to kind of re uh, get uh, get another run going again. And sure enough, his last fight that we have seen him at Bantamweight was a a boring decision loss at altitude to Marab Devalishvili, which again, it was the same situation that we saw at Featherweight against Volkanovski, where he got pin, pinned up against the cage, seemed uninterested in the fight and only had maybe... I want to say, honestly, like 10 strikes landed total throughout the contest. And it was a boring fight. And that was the last fight we had seen. And he was on a run prior to that. I think Jose taking time off to restructure, rejuvenate himself, maybe even just honestly just get a fresh, you know, start, you know, taking your mind off of what it was. Like, he was probably co- like frustrated with his contract. He was probably frustrated with the competition. The division plays out. He comes in, beats a unheralded dark horse of this division, who had looked unbeatable prior to this. And honestly, Jose Aldo just turned into a number two contender in this division, like overnight. Like you can't the, the amount of pressure that was on Jose in this fight. Not not not, not too dissimilar to Martinez, but like Jose literally didn't need to win. And he showed up better than we had ever seen him before at 135, which is insane. <laughs> but, you know. Well, it should have been Dominic Cruz, shouldn't it? That was the original fight. I know. No, no, I know. No. Like, that, that, that was the claims. But if you, if you believe my guy, Anik, which I do, because he's besties with Dom Cruz, he said Cruz was never officially even <laughs> offered that fight. Oh, okay. So this may it may have been lost in translation, and they're they're speculating that maybe like Aldo was saying that it was discussed, but there was never anything ever drawn up. Yeah. It would also, I would say it would it would line him up for that match next because if it if he takes Martinez's place, that puts him at twelve, and Dominic Cruz is at eleven. I. Mm. I I would say well, Dominic Cruz is who, not the fight. No, 
yeah, Henry Cejudo would be a better fight, honestly, yeah. just because of the name and the former championship value. Like, uh, just because Marlon Dominic Vera. Cruz is not there. I, Marlon he Vera. already beat he already beat Marlon Vera though. Ah, right. Was um, I would rather see Jose Aldo in the PFL smart cage than I would rather see him back in the UFC again. <laughs> Do not re-sign with the fucking UFC, bro. Get away from the fucking UFC. Yeah. Well, they might even let him box if he's over there, too. They will. They, they will. will. And I bet you they would fucking sign him for a fucking $2 million a fight deal. Well, throw the bag two. at him. Who's the other, who's the other his- historic featherweight champion over in the PFL slash Bellator League now? Patricio Ferreri. We finally yeah. get that fight. <laughs> Ten years overdue, but we finally get it. There's so many people over there that they could match him up with now. Like with the addition of all the Bellator guys, there's a multitude mm-hmm. of fucking people that we could see him take on. Aldo well, even if he wants to go, yeah, I was say, yeah, Patrick like, Mix. yeah, but like, I, I would fucking watch the <laughs> show. That's him a star. Versus, it would be a versus, fairly, uh, yeah, it would be like, a big name. PFL. Ray Collard would be a fucking good fight. Uh, there's just there's a number of guys that he could take on over there. Like it, it, you you resign with the fucking UFC, you're right back in the same bullshit fucking scenario that you've been in for so long, dude. Like you you literally close the door on a multitude of opportunities if you resign with with Dana and the fucking piss ass UFC. Do you okay? So then I would say, do you think he resigns with them? No. Hopefully not. I, I think he, I think he does. I think he does just because he wants to at least have one more belt. Um, God damn, did he look good tonight? And honestly, he could probably depends give, what the UFC offers him. Uh, we know the UFC's tied John off in his contract. He's never getting out of the UFC. He's got eight fights on his contract. Dudley does the same to Aldo, but they'd have to give him big money. Surely. I think he might be worth the money, considering. I think that now that he has the chance to shop around and get some different offers, there's no way the UFC is going to be able to compete with. If the PFL does want to make a stab at him, which they should, there's no way that Dana is going to open up the checkbook as wide as they will, because they, they have to. They have to throw money at these guys if they want to get them. You know, that's that's just the the moral of the story here. If they want big talent, they've got to pay more. They've got to pay the premium. And I just don't see, you know, UFC being able to compete with those numbers that he's going to get offered. <laughs> what about a one fight? Jose, Jose Aldo versus Rod Dang. Mixed rules. I could see it. Although I want to trust Chatri. <laughs> No offense to your Chatri, Dave. Hey, not, not our Chatri, that Chatri. <laughs> yes, that one. There's that specific one. <laughs> All right, are we yeah, done with I, that one then? Or do you... Yeah. Oh, I was yeah. just going to say, I just, I, I hope whatever he gets, he gets something that's worthwhile. Not like, you know, he had to take this fight because he had to, to get out of his contract, right? Yeah. It's not like he was like excited to fight Jonathan Martinez. He's like, all right, I'll do a solid. You guys need a star. I'll be on this card. Why not? That's why I'm thinking maybe he jumps up the rankings and fights um, uh, Corey um, Sandhagen when he comes back from injury. If he was going to be, if he was going to come back, unless, I mean, because he's already beat Rob Font. Uh, he hasn't fought O'Malley or Duvalishvili. He's already fought and lost to Jan. You know, he beat. There's a couple of names that he's already fought and beat in this division. There's two that he hasn't, and both of them are should, should be fighting um, them each other fairly soon here. Okie dokie, then. Let's move on to Anthony Smith defeats Vitor Petrino by submission. Guillotine choke, the second one of the night, at two minutes of round one. Uh, I know I ch- checked out the picks on that, the, the Discord and uh, occasional listener, uh, Misty, or Misty and Bonnie, as uh, full name is, was one of the very few people that uh, picked Anthony Smith, had some faith in uh, Gustav uh, Sr. Um, 
and I know that's going to be mentioned a little bit later, probably by <laughs> later. Um, but yeah, uh, jump jumps the well. I think Petrino pretty much allowed him to get a guill- guillotine on him, allowed him to sink his legs around him and get some hooks around his back, and then down he went. And Anthony Smith just finished him off. Uh, a really, really tight guillotine. Very nice job. Um, and I didn't pick Smith, but I'm so happy that he won. As I said, we'll see a happy Anthony Smith on Believe You Me the next time he turns up. Uh, <laughs> and he, he was claiming it, you know, there's, there's levels, as he said, and obviously there are. And clearly the unbeaten young guy made a mistake and just allowed Smith to sink in a guillotine. I've got something else to say about uh, chokes with uh, Anthony Smith, but we'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> Unless Lazy beats me to it, or anyone beats me to it. Go on, Lazy, what you got to say on this one? Oh, boy. God. The worst part of all of this is now Anthony Smith is going to think he's back in the fucking title conversation. Oh, God. God forbid. And he's already doing it. He's already. I seen some of the uh, clips of the post fight shit, the uh, press conference, and he's sitting up there all smug and arrogant, thinking he's fucking hot shit again. Oh, God. Um,. You know, this is this is the kind of fight where like my thoughts beforehand, and then looking at it with hindsight afterwards, it's like, how did I not see this happening? Because it, it's it's it was such a super obvious way that this this fight was going to end. Petrino is a wild man; he swings like crazy, he takes big risks. Uh, Smith, while not uh, you know the most dynamic athlete anymore at this point in his career. He is a veteran. He is a a good guy with his jujitsu. And, you know, Petrino just basically fell into the fucking trap. And uh, I don't remember where I seen it, but I heard somebody, they were, they were quoting Anthony Smith uh, and like his thoughts during the fight. And I guess like he said, he was basically, thinking as it was happening, like, really, you're just going to let me take your neck and you're just going to let me guillotine you like right here. You're not even going to, you're not going to address this whatsoever. And that's, that's how it was, fucking it was interesting seeing Anthony Smith laying out with the leg kicks because he took the leg kick game early in the fight. Yeah. Um, yeah. Apparently he has spent some time at extreme couture with Eric Nixick, but they were saying he'd been working on his jab, which <laughs> very amusing that someone with what has he got? 50 odd fights is now working on his jab. <laughs> Maybe you should have learned that a bit, little bit earlier. Possibly, but yeah. That, so I mean, you're right. The addition of the leg kicks from Smith that was a nice, uh, nice new little tidbit from him. Especially considering he has said before on Believe You Me that he simply cannot check leg kicks. He just can't do it. He's not capable of it. So if you can't check them, fucking throw them yourself. Shit, it worked. Uh, but yeah, um, you know. Uh, a big win over a fucking young hot prospect. I hate for him to have this new thought in his head or this re- renewed thought that he is uh, back in the title mix because I think that he'll be in for a rude awakening once he does take on an actual legit contender. Um, yeah, uh, as you mentioned, uh, him being a Guskov senior, I have to say it. We discussed this beforehand, and in, in the, one of the prior episodes. Uh, now we can possibly see it. Guskov versus Smith is a, is a a real thing now. This could really happen. Yeah. We a did big we jump. Joke, we did joke about it last week, I think. Yeah, yeah, big big jump for uh, Guskov there. Uh, but fuck it, why not put them both in there? Let's see the doppelgangers go at it. I'm down with that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah, all in all, that's that's pretty much all my all I got on that. I, okay, so my whole thing was is that I just kind of figured Smith would do Smith things and allow Smith himself, uh, Gustav Singer, uh, to uh, get caught up in a you know stand and bang battle and get you know dropped. And next thing you know, he's just kind of wailing uh, uh, on his back, just getting hammer fisted into nothingness. But that's not yep. what happened. Um, no, matter of fact, it was uh, actually the opposite. Uh, the uh, Young Buck got overzealous, thinking he can just kind of run over the older vet and pretty much gave him the opening. Um, was almost defiantly ignoring leg kicks. 
like, ah, it's not going to matter. It's not going to matter. It's not going to matter. Oh, shit. <laughs> it, was like a, it was like a moment where he kind of like, you know, he jumped a little bit because it looked like one of them would like kind of gave him a stinger. But even then it was like, he just was like, I'm going to prove I'm the better fighter by physically overwhelming this man. I don't care if he's, if I'm like more talented or not, he's literally just going to jump on him. And sure enough, like he gave him the opening. And even when he tried to slam him on his back, he just, it's the one thing you don't do unless you know you can posture up and slam that person causing a concussion. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's usually, it's the opposite effect. The choke sinks in um, a lot quicker and you have no, no capabilities of getting out at that point. So it's a learning lesson, a tough one for sure, especially at home. Uh, but, you know, I don't know what to do with Smith now, but I think we were going to talk about that very quick. I think with a, a Gustav uh, bit that we were doing, you know, father and son finally meeting in the cage. <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, just keep Smith away from the title, as far away from the title as possible, unless he gets three or four wins together. And even then we'll consider whether or not he's ready. And I doubt that that's the case. Just keep him, keep him in the pool. He needs a win streak. He's not a name that you can throw into a title fight. We'll see what happens. We know Mike Bisping was at home just absolutely ecstatic. <laughs> I'm sure he was calling for his wife, Rebecca, Rebecca. <laughs> they fucking did it. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, and uh, while we're on this topic, I guess we should probably bring this up, too. Uh, apparently, after the fights, uh, when all was said and done and work had been finished, John Anik and Anthony Lionheart Smith met at, uh, I'm assuming, the hotel bar down there in Rio and got absolutely shit-hammered. <laughs> uh, Anik said today uh, on the live uh, Anik and Florian episode that he was still drunk from last night. So. Let's go. <laughs> Good for them. Well done, Anthony Smith. Uh, the other thing, I, I don't know if you saw it, there was a challenge put out by by Poetan uh, to Anthony Smith uh, that Anthony Smith couldn't choke Poetan out uh, and he'd let it, Poetan would let Alex, uh, sorry, Anthony get the hooks in, back position and then all he's got to do, he's got five minutes to choke him out and if Poetan manages to get up, stand up away from it, or he doesn't choke him out in five minutes, $50,000 bet. What do you think of that one? Stateless money. (laughs) (laughs) Stateless money. I think I'd take it, honestly. (laughs) I mean, I'd watch it. Shit. Put that on uh, one of these Polaris grappling tournaments or something like that on Fight Pass. I'd watch that. (laughs) Oh my God. Could you imagine? (laughs) Did you you see Alex... uh, Sorry, uh, yeah, Alex, uh, feigning being asleep when Smith walked yeah. into the on. <laughs> I did catch that. Somebody, somebody said that uh, uh, all of a sudden Alex has a humor transplant. The guy's got jokes now. <laughs> well, I think he's been pretty humorous. I mean, he's been on, he's been, uh, on a good kick lately with the social media. Yeah, yeah, he's been subtle. Yeah, I think he knows a little bit more English than he lets on. I'm not saying he's fluent by any means, but I'm sure he understands a little bit more. Oh no, he's doing the Anderson Silva um uh Silva play where it's all I I know how to speak it, I just choose not to. <laughs> <laughs> it's working for him, why not? Yeah. Anyway, let's let's get on to the second guillotine. Well, it's actually the first guillotine joke of the night. Uh, Michelle Pereira defeats I Hope Pateria by submission guillotine joke. Fifty four seconds of round one. Uh, does it by doing first does a crazy backflip kind of somersault <laughs> attack thing, almost slams his shit his uh, the back of his leg or his foot off uh, Pretoria's face. Uh, the judges have a real good look at it uh, afterwards and declare whether it's legal because the leg hit his chest first and they don't stop it. Plus he's Brazilian, um, <laughs> yeah, you know. And then then they get back up and instantly. Uh, Pereira sinks in a guillotine choke, absolutely lethal one. He's got the guy kind of up up, up on his tiptoes, almost leaning back. Ref, the, he taps. Ref comes in, and 
Pereira lets go of the guillotine choke, steps away to waves his arms, and the guy takes, I think, one one kind of half step and then slumps to the floor unconscious uh, <laughs> after tapping. So that was pretty imp- an impressive thing. But obviously the somersault thing being the most controversial part. But Michelle Pereira looking very, very dangerous at middleweight. Yeah, I got I got to give props to uh, our editor in chief here, Super Dave, because he called this out before the fight. He said, you know, Pereira is, uh, or, excuse me, uh, is it? Yeah, it's Pereira, or no? Yeah, Pereira. <laughs> Sorry about that, but yeah, he called it out in the chat last night that uh, he's a real beast and a contender at at middleweight here, and I, I gotta say, I think he's right. Uh, he's just a fucking absolute freight train of a man in this weight class coming in and steamrolling guys uh guys that are thought to be contenders and he's making them look like chumps i think it's time now that that we actually feed him somebody fucking ranked and get him up into the rankings because uh i don't i don't remember what the number is but he's on a hell of a fucking streak here uh one of the longest win streaks in the ufc right now if i'm not mistaken Either way, it, neither here nor there, as Austin would say. Uh, just fucking an absolute total <laughs> annihilation. Uh, the backflip move, though controversial, I don't think that the the strike to the head of the downed opponent was intentional. I think it was just a flashy way of him trying to pass the guard and and you know get into a, a ground and pound position or a, a spot for a potential submission. I think he was just doing his typical flash pizzazz. And it happened to land where it landed. But ultimately, I think that that was, that was going to go down, you know, in a similar fashion no matter what, even if that didn't occur. So fucking just a brutal, a brutal annihilation in under a minute. And the sky is, is the limit for this guy, Michel. Now, just, just jumping in, Lazy, I just did a quick check while you were talking. He's got eight, eight wins in a row. Uh, I guess, uh, yeah, that includes uh, the Pateria one. And three of those are at middleweight. Just looking yes. now, he's two, what's that, two minutes, seven? He's, he spent three minutes and one second at middleweight. And that, <laughs> that's, just, that's his three fights. One minute, six, one minute, one, 54 seconds. They're just getting faster. He's... He, yeah. <laughs> like, here's the thing. Look at how massive he is as a middleweight and yeah, imagine him making welterweight. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, why? Why? Whoever his team is, I hope he basically fired him at one point and like, no, no, I am clearly a bigger man. This needs, I should be at middleweight. Because <laughs> like the minute he screws up his weight cut and comes into middleweight, it's like a completely different fight almost. It's, or a different fighter, I should say. Like, A, he went from being a boring kind of decision guy at welterweight for the last like two or three fights he had at welterweight to all of a sudden... He is this massive dude who's just like fucking murdering these guys. And he honestly looks like he's been doing this for a while, and which wasn't the case before. So I think he's finally found his groove. He's in his prime. Honestly, I'm going to I'm going to be overzealous here. I'm going to just say, give him comms at right now as is just do Ooh. it because here's the thing. Comms has not faced another athlete. That is the likes of which we've seen with, uh, Michelle Pereira. Yes, he fought a former champion, but that fight, there's a lot of asterisks on that fight specifically. This is a guy who is an actual middleweight now, has been a middleweight for a good minute, and has literally handled all of his competition, much like Hamzat used to, on which he doesn't anymore. If I'm Michelle Pereira's uh, guys, his team, I'm telling him we're going to go to Abu Dhabi the next time we get, and... um, we're fight. We're we're making a plea to face Kamzat. Quickest way to the belt is through the, uh, the um, the middleweight uh, forgotten wolf, as I as they as I want to say it. <laughs> yeah, I just double checked the uh, statistic, and that this this W now put, ties Michelle Pereira for third longest active UFC winning streak. He's now tied with Movzar Ivloyev, and the only two people ahead of him are Marab and Islam. Wow. So that's pretty impressive, I mean. Yeah. Yeah, it's not easy to do, for sure. Yeah. 
look forward to seeing him more of it. It has to be a ranked opponent, surely, next, at the very least. Kanzai. Do it. Kanzai states that he needs a win. <laughs> Kanzai no, needs to come that, bounce back. Is, is that Kanzai after Whitaker? Oh, God damn it. I can't, fuck. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. God damn yeah. it. I was going to say, are I we just believe. replacing Whitaker? No, I want I want uh, Kamzat to no longer fight Robert Whitaker because I love him dearly, and it's not because I don't want Whitaker because it's not that I I believe Whitaker beats him regardless because I'm a I'm a I'm a stand for Robert Bobby Knuckles Whitaker, <laughs> um, but um, I would prefer to see that fight because this dude has literally done more work in the last three fights of his uh, middleweight career I should say now than Kamzat has done altogether in his last three years. But that's neither here nor there. Um, there's there's a whole lot of things you could do with Michelle Pereira, honestly, right now. You could even probably throw him in there with Bo Nickel, but that's that's a dangerous that's a dangerous thing too. But like you can't you can't really make a whole lot of wrong decisions with Michelle Pereira right now. I don't think at least. Well a, a couple of potential opponents for him uh, are gonna be mentioned next. This yeah. is true. Kai Baralho defeating Paul Craig by KO at two minutes ten of round two. Uh, I think we had Craig not showing a great deal of improvement or any real talent at boxing. Uh, chin up in the air. Uh, he was he was kind of doing it. It, it was a pseudo kind of Ryan Hall versus Taboria moment. I noticed. <laughs> I, I remember that from my notes. He was constantly trying to get get it to the ground. Um, Kai was having none of that. It was like, no, 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 no. So we're going to stand and fight like men. You know, we're, we're going to do the man dance. And God damn, he did. By the second round, he he just lit him up. Um, I think walk off knockout as well, wasn't it? I, if I remember rightly. Yeah, yeah, more or less. Yeah. So, as much as I like to make patriotic picks, I did not pick Paul Craig for this one. I knew he was going to get, and you know, I don't like throat tattoos, but Kai, Kai, Kai Barallo, uh, I could not, pick, could not not pick him in this one. So yeah, brilliant job by him. Not sure what happens to Paul Craig next, unless we feed him till Michelle Pereira, um, which could be entertaining, I guess, as long as it lasted. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. But yeah just, I, I kind of figured this guy was going to beat Paul, and he did pretty easily, from what I remember. So, take it away, one of you. First off, Paul. <sighs> Paul has beautiful kicks. I I have noticed that. He doesn't use utilize them a lot, but when he does, they look pretty good. Um, he's a tall, lanky middleweight. He's older. Can't really handle his uh, uh the damage. Uh, or when someone comes in faster with better hands, and he has like a guard game which doesn't work when you have somebody who's got practical uh, grappling. And the only time it does is when it's a Hail Mary submission because the other guy's tired from beating your ass. Um, he is the perfect opponent for Chris Weidman at this stage of the game. They're both on the older side of middleweight. They're both uh, relatively limited in what they do. And um, if Chris wants one more, that's the guy I would put him up against. And if Paul uh, wants a win, that's the fight I would give him. Because, A, it kind of takes him out of the uh, rankings, more or less. And on top of it, Kyle Baraglio just kind of looked like, all right, I'm going to just let him kind of see what he gives me and then react off of it. I'm going to be the better grappler. I'm younger and I'm stronger. And it showed. This is a middleweight is not an older guy's game. You could do that at light heavyweight, and you could almost get away with it at middleweight to a certain point. And Paul Craig kind of found that out in those last two, three fights. You just, you just cannot give the younger guys any momentum. And the fact that he has a terrible takedown game doesn't help him either. Um, Kyle Baraglio just kind of looked like he just knew he was going to win. Kind of almost what we assumed what would happen with uh, Victor Petrino, uh, Anthony Smith fight, except Kyle Baraglio just didn't give him any, any <laughs> openings like, whatsoever. And remembered, oh wait, he's still he's still, he's still capable. <laughs> <laughs> fucking Paul Craig, <laughs> how the fuck are you in the fucking UFC 
for years now, brother, years. And this is as much as you've improved. You look the same today as the day you fucking walked into this joint. You have not advanced in any avenue or any aspect of your game. You have one of the worst striking stances and defense mechanisms I've ever seen. You, you can't take a shot. When you weight cut, you look like Skeletor. What the fuck are you doing in your life, Paul Craig? Like, this is a guy who has wins over fucking Ankalaev and Jamal Hill. And then he goes in there against somebody like a Kyle Bahio or Kyle Bahio or a, 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 a Khalil Roundtree and just gets obliterated. And you're like, is this even the same fucking guy? Like, does he have split personality disorders and fights? Like, what is happening here? Like, I don't know how somebody can live their, their fight existence and their fight life on the fringe as much as he does and have found success against elite talents and then have nights like last night where it's just like you don't even look like you belong like you just hang up the fucking gloves and call it a day go back to scotland do whatever you do but you don't belong here and i don't know because I, I i i hate to say it because i like the guy i've i've enjoyed his uh like his time on the rsd couch on mk and uh, he's fun in interviews and shit like that from what you can understand from what he says. But he's just like, you don't fit in, dude. You don't go, go do BJJ tournaments or something like that. Cause you don't belong in, in fist to cuff combat sports. You don't got what it takes. Yeah. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> he sucks. He fucking sucks. I... <sighs> No, you know what it is. He um he suffers from being the big fish in the small pond. Um like his he's originally from he's he's a he's a Scottish native, right? And yep. he hangs out with Tom Aspinall and whatnot. I'm imagining if it's the case of him having an actual decent ground game where he's it's almost like he kind of transitioned from being the sport jujitsu world to the MMA world by circumstance. Like, okay, he was obviously teaching people how to, you know, use guard gameplay, and you know, he's probably decent in international competitions, maybe. But it's almost like, okay, well, obviously this isn't making enough money for me. I'm gonna also try to fight, and he happened to just have better grappling exchanges or weaponry than a majority of the guys he faced. Plus, being a taller, uh, lanky guy is usually better for jiu-jitsu anyways. Um, he, just, he just never added enough to the game overall. He's, he's joined the sport 20 years too late. If he'd have been around yeah. in great times, he would have been fantastic. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And unfortunately, that's the case here. It's like, I, I, I'm not going to bury him, but I'm going to say, like, dude, like, he has moments where he looks, you know, he throws a kick, he throws a jab, and then he just doesn't do anything or capitalize on it because he's just like, all right, I'll just, I'll just wait for him to kind of engage with me, and then he'll just crash into somebody. Or they'll crash into him, and he pulls guard. Like, yeah. you, and then they step out of it. As you, as yes. you said, he was, he was landing some very nice body kicks, slamming those home, but... Why, why, as you said, why not throw more? You're a jujitsu guy. You don't care if you get taken down. Yeah. So yeah. He should. You know what? You know it'd be better for him if he just learned a little bit of Muay Thai with a cl uh, clinch situation, yeah. like being, you know, it it, it misses that open uh, striking exchange, and he can land elbows from the clinch as well as knees. And if, like you said, it it would almost benefit him because he's a he's taller. B, he's got longer limbs, and C, he can land pretty willingly in that clinch and not have to worry so much about damage as much as he does when he's just leaving his chin open in the air. But that's neither here nor there, as they say, because he's not, he's not a top guy, unfortunately, which is why I want him to fight Chris Weidman in his next fight, and the loser pretty much retires. At least that's what I would expect. 
No, kind of a fun fight. I, I wouldn't have been surprised if he'd have taken his gloves off tonight. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to lie. I half expected that. He is 11 years into his MMA career, and that was his 18th fight in the UFC. And that's the level of your striking. I don't know, man. What are you doing in your downtime? Like in, between fight, in between fights, what are you spending your time on? You're a professional athlete you do it for a living. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, he's probably doing backflips on a stage. <laughs> <laughs> That's, I mean, he said it himself. <laughs> yeah. Just remember, don't wear the tight jeans next time. Yeah. <sighs> All right. Let's go on to the next one then. Having mocked uh, Paul Craig <laughs> enough, I think, there. Uh, Joanne. <laughs> Joe Anderson Brito defeats Jack Shaw by TKO. Leg kicks. We'll get onto that in a moment. At 3.35 of round two. This was my patriotic pick because I did pick Brito originally. And then Lazy <laughs> reminded me last week that Jack Shaw was Welsh. So I picked him. So I'm blaming Lazy uh, for costing me a pick there. Uh, and, and of course, the ring doctor. There's no doubt that Brito was winning the fight. It was far more effective. Controlling the action. Uh, landing some vicious leg kicks one of which apparently burst Shaw's shin open somehow, uh, causing blood to run down it. The ref stepped in, called the doctor in, doctor looked at it, jammed his finger in it, wiggled it about a bit, and then declared the fight <laughs> was on. So we have the first ever... I mean, I mean, it's a TKO leg kick, which is far from... I think it actually says cut on leg in the description. I'm not 100% sure. But yeah, stopped by leg kicks. Again, another dodgy Brazilian decision on this one. And take it away, because there's not much else I can say on that one. So let let me say this. Um, I was listening, and uh, I I think I say, you know what? No, just if it bleeds, because it was, I think, right before the uh, the cut happens, it was already a hematoma on his shin. So there's already a bunch of blood that's built up with nowhere to go. And if I'm not mistaken, he had basically said, if there is no circulation and it's just clotted around, that that creates a bad situation. Obviously, infection can be an issue, but at a certain point, you need to stop the bleeding. Yes, it's not where his face is, but it's not about that. It's about the issue being it's an open wound that doesn't stop bleeding. And yes, it wasn't a very big wound, but it was bleeding, bleeding pretty profusely um, with a bunch of buildup around it that was already swollen. So you now you have a pressure point that basically isn't closing. And then there's also a lot of buildup from the blood that was kind of like swollen behind or the muscle tissue behind that that was already swollen. So it, it's just a bad situation to have. Um, so I'd, I'd take his advice on it and saying that it was probably a good idea to stop it. <laughs> at, least, uh, at least from the perspective that he gave um joe anderson burrito is uh, a man who tries my patience uh, <laughs> and, and it's not that i don't like him i just you know he did the whole funny thing with uh john uh jonathan pierce um you know the you know do something about it boy and he's all <laughs> right <laughs> um but um he uh he just showed like this is what happens when you have a guy who comes up and wait and he hasn't had to have a physical uh, or had to have to worry about a physical game. Um, unlike when he did when he was at 35 and he, in his loss to um, Ricky Simone. And um, that physical game uh, that an athlete can bring basically disrupts him. And that showed in here. Like, obviously, he looked pretty decent on the feet, but he just had no answer for the physical game of Brito. He tried. He gave it his best and probably would have lost a you know a close decision had it gone the distance. But like, this is the problem when you got a guy whose physicality doesn't show up in the weight class because he's used to kind of staying at distance. Can he wrestle? Can he you know take people down or defend a takedown? Yeah, but when the other person is obviously the better athlete, that tends to show that he kind of lacks in that department a little bit. And it's not that he can't improve upon it, but he's going to have a hard time in this weight class if. He can't handle the physicality coming from these bigger guys. And that's something he struggled with in his last 
uh, loss, this being his second loss inside the UFC, I imagine he's going to need to change some things up. And, um, you know, it's unfortunate, but I think it was the right course of action to stop the fight. Yeah, I'm I'm disappointed here because I was really hoping that uh, Mr. Jack Shore would get the win so we would get to hear DM do some valley talk. So that's a big <laughs> letdown. <laughs> what I want to say here is, ew, that was fucking gross. The fuck is that referee or doctor doing fucking diddling his leg hole like that? That was nasty. <laughs> he was like fucking first knuckle deep on that hole. That was fucking <laughs> stuff. Uh, it's like, find your own fucking orifice to finger, buddy. Get the fuck out of here. Jesus I don't know. What, kind of, what, what, what medical examination is that? I need Daz to tell me that. What, what well, are we at, least, at least we know uh, the answer. Uh, actually, I suppose it's the other way around. Isn't it? Have you ever fingered a, uh, an MMA fighter? Uh, <laughs> as opposed to fingered by, as Tom Aspinall asked. I've got a question. Okay. Have you ever been fingered by an MMA fighter before? Fingered? Yeah, fingered. No. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> yeah, like in the moment I was I was pretty okay with the stoppage because that looked fucking gruesome, like as it was happening live. Uh especially when the doctor started messing around with it. Like I thought I wasn't sure what exactly happened, if a, a piece of bone was popping out, or it looked like there was a bit of like meat just kind of, kind of flapping there. It was bleeding pretty heavily. And then you see the pictures today. The aftermath when Jack Shore went to the hospital and got it cleaned up and stuff, and it's just this little tiny fucking like it's barely anything. It was a couple of stitches and that was it. Yeah. So him, it, him and his his cornerman and stuff, uh, his team, they're pretty upset about it and they're they're objecting to it. I don't know if they're going to file any sort of actual like appeal, but um, a very weird uh, kind of peculiar stoppage. Um, that I'm still sort of on the fence about because, like I, like I said, in the moment, I was all for it. But looking at it now, I don't really know how to feel. So, uh, unfortunate for Jack Shore, uh, his second loss now. Um, Brito is a fucking madman. He fights. He reminds me of a little, like, Vanderlei Silva. Just all action, all go, all the time. No breaks on that guy. Uh, but, you know... Just yeah, overall, overall disappointment, and also, ew, that was gross. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, again, I think it's just a matter of like they didn't want to be responsible for a medical issue happening on the night, and I mean, it's it's a Brazilian commission, so I think them the the UFC doesn't have a whole lot of events out of country um, as of late. Um, especially when it comes to pay-per-views. Uh, so I'm imagining they're like, well, we just, we want them to be able to come back and we don't, we, we would rather not have an issue uh, with a fighter um, having some kind of a medical emergency and play it safe than, you know, allowing someone to go out there and then we find out, okay, maybe they, you know, maybe letting this guy go out there and then finding a month later he had to amputate his foot because of it, you know, probably <laughs> wouldn't have been the best, mes- you know, they, message to they, send. They did mention on the broadcast, too, that uh, the the doctor there in attendance was under the impression that he thought he broke his leg. He thought there was, like, a, a breakage in the leg, so that's why they called it. He wasn't even limping. Yeah. <laughs> fishy, yeah, fishy, I mean, I, please. Yeah, well, because I think I think if you're looking at it from the commission sense, they their first in thinking and impl- an implication into this is to like played safe. The make doctor the is there make, whether make the Brazilian fighter win. That's their first thing. I <laughs> I mean, yeah, it was it was, was going to win anyway. I don't have any particular argument there, but it was a stupid stoppage. No, yeah, um, I, do I? I agree. It, it was an they, early they situation. Should have, they, should have, they should appeal it. Shore should have at least checked the kicks a little bit sooner in that case then, you know, like he was allowing the kicks to kind of get there early and quickly. The problem being is, is that again, this goes into that whole, the physicality of the division now versus the physicality that the division that he had prior to that. And the only time he lost during that time at Bantamweight was to a, a, an athlete who also struggles in that division. Like, that that this is when he faces a guys who are bigger, more physical athletes in the division above. So this is kind of, you know, this is going to be a, 
a, a roadblock he's going to keep coming up against if he no, it doesn't know how to kind of like work around it, you know. It's just going to continue to happen for him, unfortunately. Leg aside, you know. But I, I, I'm more of, let's, let's play it safe when it comes to the fighter safety kind of thing. Yeah, it sucks in the moment, but like it, it it's just, a, I'd prefer to not have to, you know, it, ha, had it even been on his head, okay, maybe then we can have a discussion of like, okay, well, did they try to actively stop it from getting worse? I think this is a situation that's just more or less best up to the uh, medical professionals in that case, you know. It sucks. It absolutely sucks for sure. And if his leg wasn't actually damaged or injured, I think it's more of a, okay, well, what's your, um, you know, threshold, I guess. And the, I guess that, that doctor did not have a high threshold for um, what he was looking at as damage. So this is going to come as a bit of a surprise to my co-hosts. They knew I was up to something, but not what it was. Uh, and so we're going to try a new little segment. It may be a one-off or we may do it again sometime. But this is the halftime show. Stepping through the ring, it's the halftime show. Just play radio, we about to let it flow. Hosted by Danger Mouse, he's on the mic. Asking questions, going deep, shining that light. Lexi K and Austin, they're on the hot seat. Talking MMA, the knowledge is elite. Just play radio, we keep it real. Talking MMA, bringing the thrill. From Austin to LA, we hold it down. Nice, nice. <laughs> All right, I'll stop it there. Uh, <laughs> it, it's not a perfect cut. I'll I'll give Dave the uh, full thing because there's bits of bits out of the song that I liked and really fitted together, so I've slashed them <laughs> together. Uh, but so I have a couple of questions for my co-hosts. I want their opinions on a couple of things, and we'll see where this goes. So who wants to go first? <laughs> I, you know what why not i'll go first oh, <laughs> i'll be the victim okay you, question one then i guess so age how much do you consider it when you pick your fighters uh we of course are all very aware of that 35 year old uh statistic as regards welterweight and under but in general how much does it affect your picks not just for the aging fighters but for younger fighters too uh say when they're facing an older but not that old opponent you know, a 21 year old versus 25 or a 27 year old. So obviously, records play a huge part. But does influ- uh, does age influ- influence you very much in general at all, Austin? Uh, it, yes. Only, only when it comes to damage, I would say. When I, I know a fighter has taken a lot of damage, it's in, and they're also a little older. It usually kind of plays into the idea of like well, like Volkanovski as of late, where age and damage is against him. You know what I mean? Yeah. I would say yes. Okay. Lazy? Does age factor into my selection of a fighter? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, prime example of that would be last night with uh, Karolina Kovalkiewicz versus uh, Yasmin Lucindo. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think that that was uh, the largest age gap ever in a woman's fight in UFC history. So it doesn't always have to be so extreme for me to take it into account. But yeah, I definitely do, uh, especially depending on uh, where they all do fall on the uh, spectrum of age. Yeah, that that was one of the reasons I changed my pick from Aldo because he's thirty-seven. And yep, he's, yep. You know, a thirty-seven-year-old is one thirty. Is it one thirty-five? He's fighting it, isn't it? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. That's just <laughs> seems off the scale for me. <clears throat> so yeah, so uh, I know I know myself and Dave were looking at the age the age video that MMA MMA on point did for the thirty-five-year-old stat, and it was one of the reasons I picked against Pantoja because at thirty-three versus a younger fighter. Roughly speaking, he, only, he should only win about 30% of those. And of course, he didn't. He won that one. So, yeah. So it's definitely a factor, but it's not the be-all and end-all, we can say. No. <laughs> and another little fun one. Uh, the question two, I guess. Uh, 
I guess Lazy gets this one because Austin took a shot at the first one. So <laughs> many, 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 many years ago when I took my first stand uh, at grading, we had to detail our most effective and dangerous techniques from the syllabus, well, from jiu-jitsu as a whole. Um, I can't remember which ones I did. I know hip throw was amongst them just because it's a very basic technique. Uh, but in MMA, what do you think is the most effective and dangerous punch in the UFC? What punch does the most damage and which one gets the most uh, KOs? And this is purely subjective. I couldn't find any stats. Uh, I did ask uh, YouTuber Strike Savvy about it, and he apparently might have a video discussing this uh, subject or something similar to it in the future. Uh, and if you do enjoy strike breakdowns, this guy is absolutely top shelf. Uh, there's, uh, I'm only mildly hating on the weasel, but there's none of this light, medium and heavy shots uh, kind of stuff. He breaks fights down by accuracy, placement, looks at the fighter's overall record before the fight, compares it to the actual fight he's looking at. Uh, so anyone who's listening, I heartily recommend you take a look at his channel. And that includes my co-hosts if they haven't uh, taken a look at him. So yeah, uh, Lazy, which, which punch is the best in the UFC as a whole? Most damage, most KOs. I would say, basing off the fact that uh, I would imagine more fighters fight from an orthodox stance than Southpaw or Switch, and it's been popping up a lot lately, so I imagine that it, the history probably dovetails the same. So I'm going to say left hook, because I think that... Uh, Majority of guys in the UFC are getting caught with a lead check hook, which in most cases is going to be the left hook. So, yeah, I'm going to go left hook. Austin? Hmm. I kind of have two that I'm thinking of, but I think, and it's like the one we think is the most uh, devastating, right? Yeah. Overall, I... you know, does, does the most damage, gets the most KOs, wins the most fights. Uh, I would say the uppercut, honestly. Like I would, I would have loved to say like a head kick or a um, a uh, an overhand right. It's punches only, so. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, then yeah, I would have said that uh, the uppercut because it's usually when they least expect it. Catching those guys coming in for takedowns. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Curtis Blades would know about that. <laughs> I actually, I actually think the same as lazy. I think the left hook is uh, probably the best. And again, because there's more people in orthodox stances, and of course you've got Alex Pereira uh, killing people with that with a touch of that left hand. So yeah, it's not it fair. A it's a bomb. It's a it's a literal bomb in his hand. That's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> might be a touch of recency, might be a touch of recency bias, but yeah, I thought. That, yeah. <laughs> There's a guy named Larry on the Discord that's gonna be real happy to hear this left hook. <laughs> Yeah, he's a Steve Ersig hater, though. Oh. It's saying he's a fraud. Larry loves to troll. You can't, you can't put too much weight into he, his... He does indeed. I <laughs> mean, he's not, he's not wrong that, that Steve Ersig wasn't ready, but, like, I mean... Larry, Larry, Larry picked it right. I think me and him picked a Pantosia because most of the Discord was still picking against Pantosia, so, yeah. Hey, he's got his time. He's got his time to gloat. So <laughs> he's a former guest on here. So yeah, can't be too much on him. All right, that's it for the halftime show. I guess I just had a couple, <laughs> just had a couple of questions to have a laugh with with my uh, co-conspirators here. So we'll get back onto the we'll get back onto the card. Yasmin Lucindo defeats Carolina Kavelkovic by unanimous decision, thirty twenty seven on all three cards. Uh, I don't think there's that much to say on this fight. Uh, it was young fighter beats old fighter. 22-year-old, I think, Lucindo was. 38 or 39 for Carolina. Uh, I know she was on a four-fight win streak, but it had to come to an end, and I couldn't see it happening any other way. I, again, I had, to, I had to pick the throat tattoo for this one. <laughs> yeah, it was just a fairly dominant yeah. fight for, for Lucindo. That's all I can really say. Yeah, but poor Carolina, man. Like, she's always been a fan favorite, and I'm not going to say why. I'm not going to get into that, but the, the people oh, love her. She's <laughs> much beloved by the people. Uh, 
And last night was just not her night. Like you said, DM, the younger, fresher athlete came in there and I mean, more or less just mopped the floor with her. I can't recall her really having any moments of uh, impact or significance throughout the fight and scorecards reflect it. 30, 27s across the board. We, we've talked before about how um, they tend to age a little bit more gracefully in women's MMA. So that the, the window for uh, success is a, is a little bit longer and, and lasts a little bit later into uh, the career than it does for the men. But she's just, she's at the tail end of things and you could let her keep hanging around and fill out some cards with her in the future, some, some prelims or things like that. But you're not getting too much value out of her and she doesn't really have uh, a lot of opportunities career wise lying ahead of her. So it would, it, it wouldn't have been a bad night to retire. I think she would like to go out on a win. So we'll probably see her at least one more time, but Yasmin Lucindo, uh, young hot prospect in uh, the strawweight division, which is always in need of, of new fresh faces. So, um, yes, a stupid neck tattoo, but she's uh, she's a good fighter. So, props to Yasmin Lucindo. <laughs> yeah, um, pretty much. Yeah, like it's hard to say anything else on this one that hasn't already been said. Uh, but no, it's just disappointing because I was I was kind of hoping that she'd get one more, just one more win, and then maybe get a title fight. But I think that's out the window now. Um. No, nah, yeah, Yasmin Lucindo is she's a prospect and in this division as well. It's it's a lot harder to get headway now. Um you know, that being said, you know, Carolina was in it. She was just getting beat by the better athlete. Unfortunately she's not an athlete, so it kinda comes into play, you know. And it's kinda just disappointing for uh, you know, Carolina fans overall because she's a nice person, you know. You kinda hope for the best for the nicer people in this sport because there's not a whole lot of them so you know tough break but you know she was a pick for the heart not from the head if you're going to pick yeah yeah Yeah. exactly uh, last thing i want to add to that is in a sense that she's she's kind of like a relic at this point she's a bit of a throwback she's from that first wave of women fighter uh, women's fighters that came into the ufc and you know, her heyday has come and gone, but she'll always have a place in the, you know, the the hearts of the fans, so. Yeah. Okay, then. On to the guy whose na- name caused a little bit of uh, discussion on the commentary team. Mick Tebeck Oralby defeats Elvis Brenner. Unanimous decision, 29-27. Uh, all three cards, obviously. This was a, f- a fun one. Orlby seemed to be ahead, if I remember rightly, the first two rounds, most of them. And then Brenner managed to grab and get some dominant position right at the end of the second round and started the third round much more confidently, unless I'm getting my fights mixed up, but I don't think I am. And then right very near the end, it was looking... Oh, sorry, in the... I could forget which round. Was it the second or was it the third? Uh, Orlby punched the fence... As, as Guru pointed out and said it, uh, maybe grabbed a couple of fingers into it and the referee was all over it, took a point straight away, no look, you know, no instant replay or anything, w- telling the judges that's a point. And then right, it, it was looking like um, Brenner was going to steal the round. And then with, I forget what it was, like 15, 10 seconds, it might even have been even less. Uh, Oralby managed to hit him and knock, knocked him to the floor. And that took any chance of him winning the round away. So he lost the point, but still won 29-27. Uh, what do you think of the point deduction and the fight as a whole? Uh. <laughs> mm. 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 Um, let me go first real quick, Lazy. I'll, I'll be quick. Um, yeah, <laughs> This man was fired from the high stage. <laughs> waiting for this moment to show up in the UFC <laughs> and he proved he proved that he is worth uh, his weight in stone physically <laughs> um, I should say ice but you know that's another story uh, <laughs> um, no they they try to screw the screw my boy here and um, 
that's some chicken shit. I mean, like, like, yeah, we get it. There's some home cooking, but like, there's no, like, yes, there's a, there's a warning. And if you want to go ahead and go out of your way to be like, okay, well, if you do it again, I'm going to take a point. Okay. You have a discussion about it. And obviously there was some sketchiness, you know, not just from, you know, one fighter. There's a couple things that would have happened if this is the one fight you want to do it in. It's just weird, but you know, whatever my boy, uh, Orobai, I'm not uh, Makdebek Orobai. Uh, I'll just call him um, the oh, caveman. Let's just, just, just call him the caveman because it's easier. But no, <laughs> uh, he he handled uh, Brenner for most of this fight, and he kind of had lapses in you know judgment. But like realistically, he handled Brenner. Like he 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 started as a welterweight last minute and handled the man that he fought. I forget who it was. I think it was. Um, Elvis Sinisic, or not, maybe one of the other two, but um, he he showed up, and he looks like an actual, con- like a guy that could be at something in this division. Just, they tried to screw my boy, and that didn't work out, so, hey. <laughs> what are you gonna do? Uh, you know, like you were saying, Austin, uh, Mick DeBeck, he was a career lightweight, but he did uh, fight his UFC debut at welterweight. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think I heard Mike Heck say today that he maybe, or maybe it was, I think it was Mike Heck. Uh, he fought his, he's fought his last couple of fights at welterweight, but he's prior to that was a career lightweight. So uh, people that were in the know about him were, were curious to see how he was going to look back down at what was his, uh, you know, natural, I guess he would say uh, weight class. And there did seem to be a bit of uh, cardio issues, but that was kind of a problem for both guys. Both guys were spent, absolutely spent in this fight. Um, the point deduction for the, f- well, quote-unquote fence grab, kind of weird, but I've been seeing that more and more, uh, not so much in the UFC, but in a lot of like the smaller promotions that I watch. The refs are getting a lot quicker to just immediately deduct a point. Uh, no warnings, uh, oftentimes not even stopping the, the action, just signaling to the judges, you know, one point, which I don't know if that's kind of a, uh, a closed door memo that's been going out uh, to the referees because they do have their, um, their discussions and conversations where they make small changes and slight changes to their, their, refereeing tactics and techniques i've heard big john talk about it so i don't know if that's a new thing that they're maybe trying to implement more like more rapid fire point deductions for things like fence grabs but to me i don't i don't necessarily think it was warranted and i agree that they were it seemed like they were trying to screw mr oral by uh but you can't fucking screw somebody who came all the way here from the fucking neolithic age so <laughs> <laughs> the fucking Luke Thomas, Luke Thomas's early man got it done last night. <laughs> he wasn't in his hotel eating pad thai with his bare hands, or maybe he was, I don't know. But he fucking got the job done. Uh, Mick DeBeck, a uh, Team Alpha Male product, so you're not fucking guillotine choking this guy. He's got defense for those kind of uh, submissions, so... Uh, questionable moments there for Brenner. I believe he did go for a guillotine or two and they and failed. Um, but yeah, just a fucking real solid fucking rocked up lightweight of a man. Uh, very physically strong. I don't know how advanced he is in uh, his, his variations of technique. He, he seems a bit like a one trick pony, but you know, as, as they always say, wrestling is the best base for MMA. So, well, I yeah. think he was getting the better of the striking a lot of the fight. When yeah, that's corner, true. Well, when his corner telling him to keep it striking because he was doing better that way. He did rock him a few times, yeah. I, I will just say one thing. Always fear anyone with a Russian-sounding name who comes into the cage wearing a strange-looking hat. <laughs> <laughs> cool hats remain undefeated in 2024. That's so right. Far. So next up then, Drakkar Close defeats Joachim Silva. Unanimous decision, 29-28. Uh, I, had, I think I had Close winning the first two rounds and Silva getting the third round. But I didn't have any problem with the scores as it went. Uh, I thought Drakkar was more dominant. 
I did have quite a few notes on this, but unfortunately they've vanished off into the ether. Um, <laughs> so yeah, uh, I'm not going to have a ton to say on this one. It, it was just a simple decision. There's no contra- controversy about it. Plus, looked good enough to get the job done, and he did. Not sure what's next for him. That's probably yeah. this card. Hardly anyone was ranked on it. I think there are only two or three ranked fighters on the entire mm-hmm. league. I don't know what you really, really say about this fight. Uh, probably the most boring fight on the card. Jakar Close, <laughs> a, a notoriously boring fighter. Oh. Uh, <laughs> I don't like him. I never have. I don't like his stupid <laughs> fucking... He's got Michigan tattooed on his chest. I don't like oh, Michigan. Oh, see, it's personal. Then. It's not... <laughs> yeah. I'm from Ohio. Fuck the whole state of Michigan. Holy shit. <laughs> Hate for a tattoo. I can get behind that. <laughs> Yeah, well, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll exclude Eminem from this statement I, I just made, for DM's sake. <laughs> but yeah, uh, just, Dracar Close is not an exciting fighter. He never really has been. Is, is he good at what he does? Sure, but you're, you're not going to be wowed by him. Uh, I'm pretty sure nobody on the Discord had picked Silva, so that tells you basically everything you need to know. You know, boring-ass fucking decision. It is what it is. God damn. All right. I I liked your car. He's not <laughs> I, <laughs> He's not the best fighter, but god damn it, like he's showing up as a, a a lightweight that should have been fighting a lot more than he has. I mean, considering that whole, you know, Jeremy Stevens incident, but um he's lucky he won the first two rounds cuz that third almost looked like it was working towards a 10-8 maybe, but you know, he got the decision, good for him. It's another payday. Hopefully he fights in the States this time. And, uh, you know, that's all you can really ask for. Short and sweet. All right, let's go on to a more exciting uh, fight then. Mauricio Ruffy defeats Jamie Malarkey by TKO Strikes. Four minutes 42, round one. This was... Austin, you were comparing how someone looked to someone else earlier on. And (laughs) Mauricio, Mauricio Ruffy was giving me the Conor McGregor versus... Um, Eddie Alvarez vibes. He had that, you know, that <laughs> wide, he had that kind of wide open stance, almost by bouncing around. Uh, looked really, really nice. He was just, I mean, he was memeing on Malarkey through a, um, scissors, a scissors takedown on him at one point. I think that was. I am talking the right fight, aren't I? Yeah, yeah. He yeah, he yeah. literally threw it behind him and caught him <laughs> in it, and then as he yeah, tried to get up. <laughs> He was he was like clutching with him and then he clawed him again with like a a, a, a right hand I believe yeah that I, I don't mean to cut you off but like goddamn like this guy looks good <laughs> yeah exactly yeah no it's fine like I said I, I lost all my notes so. but yeah I remember I really really enjoyed this one it was a fun fight uh, Malarkey tough as boots but just got mashed up I was very glad when the ref finally stepped in to uh, save him could have probably done it a little bit earlier but he waited until he. Uh, hit his knees on the floor, and then he jumped in nice and quick. Yeah. yeah. Save Malarkey from himself. Yeah, I don't know what's next for Malarkey. I think there were talk... He's an Australian, isn't he? So they might want him over in Australia. Uh, someone else, I forget, might probably Guru was saying, they haven't sacked him because it would make Ruffy look bad if the last guy he beat got sacked immediately after. <laughs> uh, but yeah, God. Would like to see more of Ruffy. That guy yeah, looks very, very good. Oh man, uh, what do you what do you say about this fucking shellacking? Just <laughs> an absolute one sided beatdown. Rufy was in there styling and profiling. Uh, Malarkey, if there wasn't already an MMA fighter named Shoeface, he'd be the perfect candidate for that nickname. <laughs> like, uh, mm-hmm. y- y- you couldn't have an uglier guy. Uh, <laughs> I believe this was a fight, actually, I said on the Discord, uh, pound for pound, some of the ugliest men in the, in the world on this card. Uh, <laughs> God damn. Yeah, I mean, if the, one, his face is so flat, you could fucking write a note on it. You could use it as a fucking tabletop. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> poor Jamie Malarkey, though. Poor, poor, poor man. Um, yeah, didn't deserve some of those extra shots, like you were saying, DM, they probably could have stepped in a little bit sooner on that. I'm sure Dom Cruz was sitting at home very happy with that stoppage. Uh, Rufy seems to be 
kind of the the dark horse of the night, the guy that stole the headlines a little bit. There's a lot of people singing his praises. There's a lot of comparisons to the Conor McGregor style. Uh, oh, it wasn't just me then. No, no, I heard that a couple of different places. All right. So uh, you know, you're, you're not alone in that. There's people actually seeing uh, uh, the resemblance, but you know, um, I don't know really what this does for him. It's a nice little introduction uh, to the the UFC audience. Who do you pair him up with next? Is a you know kind of up for a question because I don't know how he would fare in the grappling department. And at lightweight, that's that's going to be a, a big hurdle for him to overcome. Uh, I'm not too familiar with his uh, work, so I could be wrong here, but I think he's primarily a striker. But, you know, he's a fucking fun fighter to watch and definitely a, a guy to keep your eye on um, if you're looking for was fun he the guy, Was he the guy who said he'd beaten one of um, Islam's protégés? I have no in clue. The, in, the, in the contender or something? I'm pretty sure he was on the contender. Yeah. I don't know who he fought, though. Okay. Yeah, he came from the Contender Series, I think. But, I, it, yeah, that's it, it's escaping me who he fought. So. Okay, sorry, sorry, ladies. Carry on. <laughs> well, good. Uh, I mean, that's pretty much all I had on it. Just, you know, uh, I don't know what you do with Jamie Malarkey, and I don't know if I really like that idea of turning him around for the purse card. It's three months away, and... He took quite a beating. He is a tough bastard, so I wouldn't be surprised if he does wind up on it, but I don't know if I'd want to see him back that quickly. No, yeah, same. You might want to put this guy on that card then. It didn't take any damage. No, you put him up against an Aussie that's a lightweight. Not, you know, or just a, just another lightweight on the prelim card, because just like this, the, the guy showed up, did what he was supposed to, looked impressive doing it, and this is lightweight. There is a handful of names you can throw in that division right now, uh, just on any other card, and you'll get exciting fights regardless, or one-sided beatdowns, because this is a sharp take of a division. Very true. Probably. Do you think he's ready for the top 15 yet? I don't know where he's rated. No, 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 no. Nowhere no. near the top 15 yet. Okay. No, yeah. <laughs> a few more fights. Baby steps. Baby steps. Get him in the apex at some point. Oh, he's going to be spending a lot of time there soon. <laughs> I hope so, to be honest. I like seeing him. I'd like to see more yeah. of him. Yeah. All right, then. Uh, next on, then. Dion Barbosa defeats Ernesto Car Caracate. I'm not 100% sure on the pronunciation on that one. Unanimous decision, 29 across, 29 28 across all the boards. I had, I thought this was a bad judging uh, thing again. Uh, and I know Guru did as well. And he picked Barbosa and he said she lost. Uh, Car ah. uh, she clearly took the first round, but the second and third, again, we're talking about damage. So again, this might be a, you know, because it was in Brazil, it's the different rules of their association. Yeah. But if it was again, if it was unified rules, I would have given this uh, given this fight to Ernesta, who won. I yeah, I mean, here's the thing: she tried to grapple with the athlete, and the athlete won the, you know, the physical department. Well, they were like, both athletes, yeah. weren't they? Because uh, Ernesto was an ex-swimmer. Uh, yeah. And, and very, very bloody tall as well. I know we were talking about it before we uh, started, <laughs> uh, weren't we, Lazy? Um, we were guessing that she was 5'10", and it turned out she was 5'9". Yeah, I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm disputing that one. I'm sure she's 5'10". Either that or there were some very short blokes around the cage that night. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But no, no, no. Like, if you looked at what she was doing on the feet, she was actually pretty good. Um, she was, if she had stuck to the uh, game plan that I would have thought they had, which was defend takedowns and def avoid clinching situations, she probably would have done pretty well. Uh, but she decided to try to grapple at points, and that's kind of the thing that kind of hurt her a little bit here. Um, I think that's what I think of when I, you know, it's like, okay, well, she, if it, if, if she had kept it standing and at range, she probably wins. But she decided to engage and murky or make it murky on the scorecards just because 
you know, when you grapple with an athlete, usually the athlete is the one that takes advantage of the situation. That's usually the problem when you have somebody who may be technically better, but is not physically better. And she's not physically better than that aspect. So I, I, it probably was her fight to uh, lose, and that's ended up being the case. She gave the fight to the better athlete, you know. It was a good fight, but that, you know, that tends to be par for the course when you face athletes these days. Great cardio. Yeah. It, it was an entertaining little fight. I enjoyed it because I, I, I stayed up and watched the prelims, and I was, I was hooked on it. I was wondering which way it was going to go, but I was surprised it wasn't a split decision from the judges. No. Nah. Yeah. Unfortunately... Lazy. My, my, my memories from this one were what you brought up, DM. I remember them talking about her being a swimmer, a competitive swimmer. And I thought, oh, that makes sense because she looks like one. She's fucking built like one. <laughs> uh, and then I do remember our carnival game where we were trying to guess her height, and we got damn close. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I was actually just thinking about the numbers. She's actually bigger than Steve Ersig. Uh, Steve Ersig, 5'8", 125. Kara Scott, 5'9", 125. Wow. So, yeah. Bigger than the, the men's flyweight title challenger. Uh, oh, yeah. And the, and the other thing that I remembered is uh, they said she was Lithuanian. So, I was like, hey, damn, I bet BC's fucking sitting at home rooting oh, yeah. for her. Oh, yeah. 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 It's a little Lithuanian fucking <laughs> on Uh Yeah. Not really too many memorable moments from this fight. Uh, you know, a, a decent scrap from both ladies. Uh, just nothing, I didn't really take much away from it, you know. Fun fight for as long as it lasted, I guess. But I hope to see uh, Kara Scott back because she, uh, she, she does have a nice frame and build for the division. And I think if she learned to utilize a bit more long-range weapons, she could... Uh, Potentially realize some success. So, absolutely, get her up to elevation. Mm -hmm. Trevor could do something with her. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not going to mention Barry. Oh, I did. Um, <laughs> God damn it! <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Uh, next up, Ishmael Bonfim defeats Vin Pichel by unanimous decision. Decision again, thirty twenty seven across the board. Um, no one picked P Pinchel for this one. He was a tough as old boot veteran, but he didn't really have anything to offer Bonfim. I think he was slightly more challenging in the first round, and then it was just Bonfim just doing more or less what he wanted to do. Again, I don't I don't recall him being particularly close to getting a finish, but it was Bonfim for the entire fight, and he an easy win for him. And I'm sure we have a fan of one of the Bonfims here somewhere. I hope. <laughs> I. You want this one, Lazy? I mean, it's up to you. I don't got. I don't got a whole lot on this one either. <laughs> I. I'll say this. Uh, Vince Michelle is that dude who shows up to the gym every single day. He's not. At, he's not athletic. He's not um, a killer. He's. A, he's just a. He's a dude. He's a guy. He's like that. That staple of the gym. That's been a. You know, a regional champion, but never really been much more than that. Um, He's he's always a difficult out, never an easy fight. Matter of fact, he he'll give prospects a tough you know run for their money, but that's it. He's um he's that old guy you gotta face at some point who's gonna test your skills. He's gonna give you some like you know different looks, and you can't really just win clean off of him because he's he's tough. You know, Bonfin proved that. You know, he was obviously the better fighter. You know, when he landed, it made you know it made. Pichelle had to kind of shell up or just kind of stall his movement a little bit, but I was laughing you know. when he got to his corner and said, uh, "I thought he said I thought Bonfim would hit harder." <laughs> <laughs> See what I mean? Yeah, he's just he's that guy, you know. Yeah, he's not going to be much more than you know, just that guy, you know, tough vet. Not, you know, he you can't really ask much more of him. But you know, Bonfim didn't look terrible. He just faced a guy that was hard to fight. That's all. Yeah, I mean, he, he had a pretty good night, Bonfim did. Uh, Pichel is sort of like, he's kind of like a litmus test. He's, the guy's only been finished twice in his career, once by knockout, once by submission. So he is extremely durable. He, it, so even if he is completely outclassed and he gets treated like a punching bag the whole fight, he's a good 
you know, eye test if you're the UFC matchmakers and you're looking at Bonfim and trying to really gauge where he's kind of at in the division. Uh, of course, he wasn't able to finish him, but you were able to see like over three rounds for the entirety of a fight, what he's able to do and what he's capable of. So I think if nothing else, if you're, if you're a matchmaker for the UFC, you, you were able to uh, get a better feel of who Ismail Bonfim is. Mm-hmm. What would you rate him at? I think he. I think he's still got a little bit more time before you go trying to break him into a top fifteen. Maybe yeah, agreed. Keep him, keep him on the outskirts for another fight or two, and uh, see what kind of progress he makes. But you can definitely tell him and his brother both they have a lot of potential. It's just a matter of will they realize it? Yeah, agreed. We don't know now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Which leaves us then with, when I can find my page, Alejandro Costa defeats Kevin Borjas by TKO strikes at 1 minute 35 of round two. Um, our friend here, Austin, was one of only two people who picked uh, Borjas. God damn it. Borjas, not, <laughs> along with Daz Riccio, I'll uh, mention. Um, <laughs> a long time listener. And uh, no, oh, I, I forgot to mention this this at the time, uh, and Austin probably thought he got away with it, but he and uh, the aforementioned Misty were one of the only two people to pick uh, Jamie Malarkey. Sorry, Austin. God <laughs> damn it! <laughs> Just fucking you sell know. me out like that. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm sticking the knife in after you beat me last week. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, cost, cost of defeat Borges, Borges. Uh, looked really, really good. Um, this was a leg kick, uh, started off with leg kicks. There was, there was a wonderful moment. I meant to uh, catch a screenshot of it when Borges took a leg kick and was looking up and his face was a picture. Uh, I really should have to find it. <laughs> my, my complaint on this one to, about Costa, you, he missed the one of the biggest opportunities. He could have opened the card with a leg kick finish and instead he went down to the ground with him and started pounding on him all the while me sat in my chair going get the get up you fucking idiot uh, you know you can, you can finish this on the feet and he didn't he still got the finish no argument you know great fight by costa um no complaints really i'm just memeing a bit there but yeah he should have he should have finished it on the feet it would have been far more spectacular and yeah uh, again another fighter if i can remember his name i'll look forward to seeing in the future this one, this one kind of has blended into the ethos of my brain, and I don't recall much of the fight, but you bringing up those leg kicks did uh, trigger something in my mind. I seem to remember, like, didn't he go down off one of them, and he was just kind of, like, looking up at him, like, you know, why the fuck did you kick me so hard? Like, yeah. is that what you're talking about that moment? Yeah. yeah I do recall that moment. Uh, there was some people online that were riding with, Borjas and I think it, it was maybe people taking a dog shot or or thinking that uh, he would tough it out because I seem to recall his last fight, his only other fight was on the Contender Series and he really showed some grit and some determination but yeah Costa just fucking out there blasting them fucking legs and then you know the ground and pound finish uh he was one of, let's see, one, two, three, four people who got a performance of the night bonus. So 50000 richer for Alessandro Costa. Nice. Well deserved. Yeah. Pleased for that. Yeah. Is that, is that lazy? Yeah, it's a, that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, the fight is up on the screen right now. I've just thrown it up. All right. So here's my thing. All right. I looked at both of their last fights because I was kind of ta- uh, torn on this one. Looking at Borjas' last fight, he his last fight was against Joshua Van. And that was a competitive fight. And that's the reason why I picked him because oh, yes, yes. Co- Costa had last fought Ursig and was, you know, kind of handled by him. So that's kind of the my thought process on it. And I'm like, okay, well, one of these guys was clearly handled. I just assumed Ursig wasn't at that level clearly he's of that level so that kind of i mistook what the you know that's the thing where you do the fight math and obviously i was wrong on costa even though he's kind of flipped and flopped against the higher level guys like uh, amir abazi and whatnot but um i just i i assumed borjas was 
a little bit more of a dog um, that was going to show up. And I, he, he tried, and then he got hit, and he got leg kicked several times, and that changed the entirety of the fight <laughs> very quickly. So Everyone else has planned until they get calf kicked. Yeah, exactly. No, that was it. You know, Costa looks good. You know, yeah, he's if he could keep the consistency, he he could be something in this division. He's just I don't put him up against anybody ranked yet. Just keep him keep feeding him guys that are like this, and maybe he can get a run together and uh, find tool or find uh f- you know uh, sharpen his tools a little bit, as they say, right? And you know, become a contender without having to jump into the deep end of the pool and you know have a five hundred record. All right, that brings us to the end of UFC 301. That's all the fights covered. So what do we think about it as a whole? What are we going to score it, guys? Oh, God. A lot of unknowns versus a lot of unknowns. One of those kind of cards that can produce some fun fights sometimes. In a Brazil that wasn't very loud or noisy, the crowd was a distinct letdown. But I understand most of them had buggered off to see uh, the revived corpse of Madonna doing some kind of show. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, I, I'm old, and Madonna was is older than me, and I, you know, I, I grew up listening to Madonna. So, you know, why she's still dancing around, uh, dressed in God knows what, with a horrifically uh, plastic surgery face? I have no idea. She's got like a twenty-something-year-old boyfriend, so. Yeah, she's doing something right. She's doing something right, maybe. But God she, damn. she's rich, not that hard for <laughs> twenty-year-old when you're rich and famous. I'm sure. I just <laughs> yeah, probably just closes his eyes when he kisses her. Oh, <laughs> sorry, <damn>. Donna. <laughs> just uh, uh, when she was married to Guy Ritchie. God damn more, it! More appreciated in England. God, that fake accent. <laughs> That's it. We're getting off track. We're getting off track. Got... We are getting off track, yeah. Do you want me to start off with the, with the score? Yes. Yes, oh, please. Let me have a quick I'll follow. See what I think. There were some fun fun results. I'm very clear. I'm hovering between a six and a half and a seven. So shall I be traditional and go 6.75? Yeah, there we go. 6.75. <laughs> Oh shit! I'll go. I'll go. Um, you know, I think I would give this probably two separate ratings under two different circumstances. I would rate this one thing if it were a fight night card, but I'm going to rate it differently because it was a pay per view. Now, if this was a fight night card, my my rating would be a little bit more generous because I think this would have made a fantastic fight night card. Paying eighty dollars for it, however, if I'm taking that into consideration, eh, I can't see justifying that. So, for me, it was it was below average. So that means we're going less than a five. Oh. It had its moments. Ah, eh, four and a half. We'll go four and a half. <laughs> wow. I, yeah, I I gotta agree. Like the fact that there's a price point on this one. And it's fight qua- uh, fight night card quality, not like the Apex, you know, quality, but it's like a fight night in Tennessee, Nashville, or Austin, or you know, yeah. um, it's Definitely. it's not, yeah. But yeah, I'll I'll, I'll say a six point five uh, for me, just because it, the main event was great, the co-main event great, you know, the main card had enough finishes on it to satisfy my taste, but. Again, the, the it's entire, just the entire main main card was was finishers. There wasn't yeah de- exactly. Oh, you know there was one decision, Aldo. Yeah. Two decisions: the main event and the comedy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. But yeah. No, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, but that's the thing. I I I'll just say that it's like um. Still guillotine. Yeah, six point so, five for me is what I'll say. It just it's just because of the the quality of the fights beforehand and the the on the. Feature in the main, um, they're in the, you know, the co-main, definitely kind of racking it up, but you know, not a whole lot of star power, I would say. 
Maybe future, future stars. Who knows? All right. That's about it with that one. In fact, that's completely it with that one. Is there anything <coughs> else anyone wants to bring up? No. Nah. That is oh, I, do. Oh, I, got, I got one thing to bring up, but it's not necessarily pertaining to this card. So I don't know if you want me to bring it up now or if you want me to wait uh, till we end this thing. Or... Fire away. We've got about 10 minutes. Okay. Well, I would be remiss if I let the opportunity pass to congratulate my role model, my icon, my illegitimate stepfather, John Anik the voice of the UFC for breaking the record for the most fights called in UFC history. Uh, there, there are a few people uh, in any industry that I feel really embody what it is to be a figurehead of an organization. And John Anik is, is nothing if not uh, just a fixture on UFC broadcasts now. Um, I loved Mike Goldberg and everything that he brought to the table for the years that he was with us, but I just feel like John brings a level of professionalism and uh, credibility to the sport that no one else had prior, and just all, all the uh, kudos and uh, congratulations in the world to Mr. Anik for setting the fucking record for the most fights called in UFC history. Do you know how many it is? I actually don't, but I know that on the podcast today he mentioned something uh, uh, recently. I, I'm not sure which pay per view it was, but his one of his producers told him that he was on his I don't even remember 2800th fight or some shit like that. So oh, it's, holy fuck, <laughs> it's a fuck. He does he keeps a fighter card for uh, like a little index card with all the fighters' information for every fighter that he calls a fight for, and he said he's up over six thousand cards. So. Wow. Yeah, that's a fucking ton. I have to love him because he gave the best piece of commentary ever in the history of martial arts, uh, maybe in the history of sports, with the, the but that is not the cloth from which he's cut moment, which yes. could, have, could have been written into any movie you liked. And everyone, <laughs> would, everyone would have been like, wow, that was an amazing finish. What a way to call it. And of course, it happened in real life. So, yeah. Congratulations, John Anik, and thank you for that particular call. Yeah. No. All righty, then I guess that's us out of here. Uh, I'm not sure what the next event is, because I didn't do that research. I'm an idiot. <laughs> Anyone... U- UFC on ESPN, Lewis versus Nascimento, live from St. Louis, Missouri. Ah. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> ah, the one I was joking, well, I was calling the two fat guys on the apex when yeah. it's... When it's in St. Louis, yeah. yeah. The the super that's a really tall guy, isn't it? That got the crazy fast kick out to uh, finish in, in his no. last time. No, no, nope. oh, but he is on the card. You're, I think you're thinking of Rebellus to Spain. Yes, yes, that's the one. Mm. Yeah, sorry, he, that's uh, he actually is on this card though. He's taking on uh, Walter Cortez Acosta. Okay, that should be a fun fight as long as it lasts. Probably not very long. <laughs> That guy's a possible future threat for Tom Aspinall. Got to keep an eye on him. <laughs> ah, shit. <laughs> so, yeah, that's, uh, we'll be back then for whatever it was that Lazy just said we were going to be back for. <laughs> <laughs> He's already forgotten. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, I'm thinking about other things. Dave can do some fancy editing and just leave all this shit in. I know, Dave. <laughs> But yeah, anyway, we'll be back next week with something that's going to happen. Just a regular uh, weekend roundup, not this full-length uh, monstrosity that we've done here. So if you've made it this far, <laughs> if you've made it this far, thanks for listening. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and we're out of here. We'll see you next time. Say goodbye, guys. <laughs> Later, <Yeah>. guys. <laughs> oh. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, oh fun, shit. Guys. I'm not going to lie. I fell asleep twice during the main part. <laughs> Greg, you're a motherfucker. He's always on. What, what do you want me to do? He's always looking and always listening. <laughs> Doesn't say shit. Ooh, ah, ooh, ooh, ah, eh, 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 da, oh, da, ah.